Good morning. So my name is Chris and I am going to be doing another presentation that I had to give for my P my urology subspecialty in surgery. So what I decided to present on was pediatric posterior urethral valves. It is commonly used acronym of PUV. And today I'm going to be pretty much just talking about what they are and some of the new papers that I've been discussing. Um, ways to identify needs for treatment with posterior urethral valves. So to start it off, posterior urethral valves were first documented by Dr. Young in 1919. He is actually the first president of the AOA organization within medical schools as well. It's a honors organization, honor society within medical schools. Uh, on a test, as well as in real life, it's more common in males with a frequency of one to 5,000. And it usually can cause, it usually can cause UTIs in children or chronic renal disease. So I'm gonna be going into the embryology just a tiny bit because it's not first year anymore. Um, and then I'm going to kind of draw it out a little bit to kind of just understand what we are talking about in order to get a better understanding of the framework of so embryology. So PUV is obstructing persistent urogenital membrane. Okay. So it's somewhere right around here. And the exact mechanism is not well understood. There's a multimodal approach potentially for it. There were some genetic components that genetic components that have been noted in some papers, but nothing too severe. It is noted that these usually form around week four when the wolfian duct fuses with an undeveloped cloaca. And in the end, it kind of looks like there's the bladder and it kind of fuses like right around here. And then this drops through to create it, to create the uh, urethra and kind of moves forward from there. And there's like an issue with the folding process in this situation. But to kind of give you some anatomy, so you have your kidneys up here and then you have your like ureter. So your like renal calyx is up here, pelvis here, then your ureter. So the urine is gonna travel down to here. And then when it gets to the bladder, you have your trigone and you have your ure uh, ureters that are pumping in fluid. And then at the very bottom right here, you have your urethra. And there's issues right here where tissue can block in different segments. So the types of PUV, there were originally documented three types by Dr. Young, but since then um, we have no longer really considered type two to be a true type of PUV. But for type one, uh, it's an abnor uh, abnormal insertion. So here's the trigone that I was talking about. Here are the ureters. This is the urethra going through. And the issue is the most distal, distal aspect of the Wolfian duct. Type three, uh, less common and it is an incomplete canalization between it. So it is possible that this is 5% of the cases, okay? But it's possible that when you first notice that a baby is not urinating and has a distended bladder, you're going to uh, try and straight cath. And when you put your straight cath kind of up here, you can kind of remove this incomplete canalization and recanalize it mechanically with your straight cath. In that situation, you're now <laughs> reducing the numbers of type threes, and that's part potentially of the reason why there is a lot more type one. Still, there's just a lot more type one in general, but um, that was discovered because one of the individuals was doing a uh, suprapubic uh, uh, drainage so that he would go through the bladder to actually drain you go through the skin to drain the bladder instead of going up the urethra. These are the types of PUV. Type 1 is the most common in like almost every single child. That, that ends up happening. It. Clinical manifestations. It is most commonly diagnosed in the prenatal stage. 
you are going to notice possible oligohydramnios within the fetus during um, development. You're going to notice uh, bilateral hydronephrosis. This kind of, you can understand hydronephrosis or bilateral hydro is when the bladder is going to be full, so the fluid is going to be start backing up, and it's going to go the ureters, and then there's the kidney. Oops, sorry. And then there's the kidney right there, and so it kind of will start backing up and building up, and that's what the hydronephrosis is. So dilated bladder because the urine can't go out here. That's when it's normally diagnosed. You're going to get something called a keyhole sign, which is this on ultrasound. And um, postnatally, you can notice these with a UTI um, because you have stasis of urine inside the bladder. It's not going to be going out. And the issue in this situation is that the bacteria here is not going to be able to be released. So you're going to have stasis, increased bacterial uh colonization leading to potential UTIs. Now let's talk a little bit about lung hypoplasia. So if you end up giving a talk about PUV, you can kind of then also discuss the effects of lung hypoplasia. This is one of the biggest issues due to the fact that, as we know, when the baby pees out um, into the amniotic fluid, the baby's mouth then is going to take up some of it as well. And then some of that is going to go down the um, respiratory system and help kind of expand the lungs. Now, if you have a situation where you are oligohydramnic, so you have not that much fluid floating around in uh, the amniotic sac, because you, you have polyhydramnia and oligohydramnia. Oligo means there's not enough fluid. Um, in that situation, you're going to have hypoplastic lungs. You're going to have not well-working lungs. So as we probably already know, in the situations, you're going to want to be concerned about the respiratory functions. And a lot of the treatments that you're going to be giving during uh, like antenatal care, um, you're going to be doing it in order to correct the lung issues, not as much the kidney problems. But moving on forward, you also have a lot of chronic kidney issues. And this can pretend, this can uh, progress to ESRD. And as we talked about previously, there are a lot of recurrent infections associated with this. And this is actually the identifying way you're going to notice uh, late stage PUV in patients that weren't diagnosed during, uh, like, while, while they were in the amniotic sac. You can get renal dysplasia as well because the, renas, the, re, the kidneys are going to be constantly destroyed. You can have VUR as well. Um, this is when the, this is when the, the urine in the bladder will reflux back up the ureters and that will lead also to hydro. And then you can have simple bladder dysfunction. So your bladder is going to constantly be full, not working properly. Your detrusor muscle is not going to be able to function succinctly. And you're going to have issues with, uh, emptying your bladder. How you're going to diagnose this, aside from the ultrasound that you're going to do when the baby's in the womb, you can do a VCUG. Uh, VCUG is when you put uh, some dye at the urethra and you're going to look at the bladder and the urethra. Um, so, oh, sorry, yeah, urethra. So the bladder and the urethra and the ureters as well. But you're going to be looking at the ureters as well and then. What you're going to notice, though, is an elongated posterior urethra, as well as a defect during the voiding phase. We kind of touched on that previously when you're going to have a lot of these bladder dysfunctions. You can also do these radionucleotide scans, DMSA and MAG3. These are a little bit more difficult, but you're injecting dye into the baby, and you're kind of watching how much is released out of the kidney and going forward. From my understanding, DMSA is used more in a static situation where MAG3 is able to be used to kind of diagnose uh, uh, like voiding speeds in a sense. So it's a more, it's like using out of velocities. So you're able to diagnose the child, um, congratulations, but now you want to go to interventions. So there are two types of interventions. There's prenatals and there's postnatals. 
as um, I kind of talked a little bit before, but I kind of want to now address more. Prenatals, these, the options are you have a vesicular and amniotic shunt, but really this is not that common anymore. The risk of you going into the skin, going into the amniotic sac of the, of the skin, going to the amniotic sac, and then going like pretty much directly into the bladder of the little baby inside the mom is like really super hard and there's a lot of issues with that and a lot of the morbidities can then result if there's not person's not well trained and still has a lot of general risk factors. The prenatal is not as common. The only reason why you're going to be doing prenatal is concerns about lung hypoplasia. But there's postnatal issues that you can do and this is a lot more common. So you can just simply do a primary valve ablation um, where you just simply, as we were talking about earlier, here's the trigone and the trigone kind of drops down into the um, uh, urethra and there's like either incomplete canalization in 5% or there's issues with the posterior portion of the valve and that's 95%. So in those situations, you're going to then want to do a surgery to kind of correct this. Now you can just do a simple primary valve ablation that you can do. A different route you can do is you can kind of look at anticholinergics and see if you're able to fix this problem. Um, and then you can kind of then move forward with a clean intermittent catheterization, the CIC, where the person's actually going to stick themselves up and then let the urine come out. I wouldn't want to do that, and I would prefer the surgery if it was me. The other things you can do, um, they're kind of dependent on the age of the child. So if it's before, before toilet train, so like usually like in the first year of life or two years of life, pretty much, you can do a vescostomy which means literally you're opening the bladder to the outside of the body. And that's a way you can drain the bladder and not have these renal issues like ESRD um, uh, occur in the child and delay the treatment. So there's also the Mitrofanoff uh, procedure as well, which you can use the appendix as a conduit in the bladder and the outside of the body. That's just simply insane. I think that's super awesome. Never seen one, unfortunately, but hopefully I will in the coming weeks. Um, and lastly, for completion's sake, you can do have high diversions. So if you can have a uterostomy or a pilostomy, not as common. You're really going to be looking at vesicostomies or primary valve ablation. So now going on to the new papers that have kind of been in, like, in different, like, journals and stuff. And it's kind of looking at the need for transplant. So as I went and I talked previously, one of the things that, was important was the end stage renal disease and all the renal dysfunctions, renal dysplasia that can result because you have a posterior urethral valve. So now the question is okay, we know that this kid probably is going to need a replaced kidney, but at what point and is it uh, at what point do we need this replaced kidney? And is this kid's PUV severe enough to warrant a kidney replacement? So there's two papers that recently came out. One of them was looking at urine osmolarity, and the the point of the paper was pointing out about urine and it being hypoosmolar. So the reason why it's hypoosmolar is because the um, the urine was building up in the bladder, and that was causing like hydro in the kidneys. That was then reducing the ability for the kidneys to function well because there was a lot of stress on them, a lot of backflow issues which led to impaired ability for the kidneys to do their job, which was um, filter out different solutes, filter out the toxins and release it. And in that situation, you were not able to um, uh, cause to have a concentrated urine. And that's why you have a hyperosmolar situation. And what they found was um, with uh, lower urinary tract dysfunctions, that a lower urine osmol is a good predictor that the kidneys are not working well and the child will need to have a kidney transplant. This was even true when they normalized for creatinine. So creatinine is another standard that you can use in order to assess kidney function. And if you're listening to this talk, that is probably so redundant for me to say because you are, you're already aware of it. But if you're not, Creatinine is an important way to determine how the kidneys are working. Now, if creatinine is normal, you can still actually use the hyperosmol or the osmolarity of the urine and then able to determine that if it's actually hypoosmol, but with a normal creatinine, then there's still indication that the child should be going in for 
a kidney transplant. This was a retroactive study in, in looking at the, the miliosmal and the creatinine in children that ended up with a kidney transplant and without a kidney transplant. The next thing is the cystometrogram appearance. And this was looking at, so I, I mentioned that ultrasound is an important tool that you can be using in order to diagnose the presence of the UV. That was the keyhole sign. So what's been happening apparently is that people are able to look and they do an ultrasound and they're like, oh, wow, there's a lot of bladder dysfunction. There's a lot of thickening of the bladder. It's not equal. Um, you know, it's not super well-defined, but I've seen hundreds of these in my life. And this one looks like it's going to be needing a kidney transplant because that bladder looks pretty messed up. Sorry, I'm drinking coffee. It's uh, 8.30 in the morning. Anyways. Um, so, yeah, so the bladder's messed up. So what this paper did was it actually looked at the shape, wall, reflux, and the diverticuli, or the SWORD score, of these bladders. And what it ended up looking at was a actual equation and some specific cutoffs that can be associated with what a distorted bladder actually means. And using those measurements, they're able to better determine when a bladder is distorted and when there are poor bladder dynamics. Because before it was like, did you feel it out? Like kind of like if you've been cooking for a long time, you just know kind of how much you should be adding in. There's no actual uh, equation for it. But what they ended up finding was there's a certain sort of sword score that they can be using and there is a abnormal bladder shape and that equals a high intravesical pressure leading to a need for a renal transplant. So that was a lot. So thank you so much for listening. Um, make sure to like and subscribe down below if you uh, are interested. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. And um, thank you so much. I'll be continuing up with more of these presentations that I'm doing throughout the year. Um, if you have any topics that you want me to discuss in the future as well, um, leave them in the comment section below and I can see what I can do. Thanks. Bye.